you slit it, you have this this um, this this ooze, this this um, this nectar that actually has that actually has narcotic potential. All right, as it dries, the poppy has these seeds inside, which we have in our bagel, in our strudel, right? And that does not have narcotic potential. Okay, but at this point in time, you know, uh, at this phase of, of, of the poppy seeds life cycle, um, this is narcotic potential, okay? <clears throat> and in olden days, right, they used that sap, right, to, um, you know, to create opium, right, and, and treat patients that, that, that had pain. They, they knew about this even a long time ago, okay? And those are called opiates. Okay? Anything that's derived directly from the poppy plant, it's called an opiate, like, like heroin, okay, morphine, Okay, and, and then there's opioids, which you might have heard about, which are more like synthetic molecules, either s semi-synthetic or fully synthetic, like um, fentanyl or uh, sufentanyl or carfentanyl, which are you know, very, very potent, um, devised in a lab to work faster and, and more potently, hundreds of times more potent than, than morphine. Um, and um, they're finding our way not just to the operating room where we use them, you know, in, in standard uh, fashion, but also in our streets now. So a lot of the um, deaths that we're seeing right now around opioids, um, we've seen the toxicology reports. Most of those are no longer just oxycodone or um, uh, oxycodone and Ativan together. It's a bunch of things. It's fentanyl and oxycodone and Ambien. And it's, it's, they have a whole cocktail in their body. And that may, may or, that may or may not be just taking, actually taking all those pills. It could be that they think they're taking a pill they got on the street, but it's made somewhere out there in a lab where they're making synthetic opioids. They're no longer getting it from the plant. They're making it in some trailer or you know, some, some lab you know, in, in a different country. And it's now brought and made into pills looking like oxycodone, for example. And then our kids are, are using it and they're dying. Okay, and right now um, it, there's a lot of people dying, and I'll show you some of the numbers. Um, you know, in, in, in towns just like this, every year there are like five to ten people dying um, from opioids over the last several years. You know, uh, it happens in wealthy towns. It help, happens in inner city towns, in inner city um, communities. Um, it's it's across demographics. Okay, and so. This is sort of some, some, some um, artwork from uh, in, the, in the lay media, right? Um, you know, the, when, we were, when we were growing up, there was the ice cream truck. Now there's, you know, people out there that, you know, are offering some other things. Um, and, you know, we've, we've built a culture here where, you know, we are um, relying on pills, on medications to solve some problems that we might be able to solve with physical therapy or rehab, right? And so, why are opioids such a problem? Why do you guys think? Why, is, why has this become a problem that we couldn't shake? Addiction. 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 Right. And why are people addicted to opioids, do you know? Why do you think? It makes them feel better. Makes them feel better. All right, can you think of something that you might have had at lunchtime or late afternoon snack that made you feel good? Coffee, chocolate, right? Donut, who knows, right? And that made you have some substance um, in your brain get released called dopamine, right? Dopamine is the love molecule, right? It's the, the you know, uh, something that makes you do things, right? Um, uh, cocaine, methamphetamines, love, okay? running, those sorts of things we like to do because those release endorphins or our own homemade opioids in our body, okay? And they cause downstream release of dopamine. And we like that. That causes habits, okay? And opioids also cause a habit if you keep taking them. You like them, you keep taking them. They also help with pain, right? But the problem is, is that the pain control aspect of them you know, kind of competes with this um, dependency as well. It can be very confusing and difficult for patients over time. 
And so they're really good short term, but after a while you may develop a little bit of a dependency because you, you kind of like these, okay? And you know, certain people that you know, might have difficulties in their life and are coping with some, some very difficult issues in their lives might use opioids to cope with those issues, right? Chemically cope versus maybe cope with them in different ways that are more mature and, and, and more difficult. Uh, particularly some, for our younger generation, you know, if they're introduced to these sorts of medications early on, they might have a very difficult time um, you know, using other techniques that are, and, and rather than relying on medications to cope with their, some of their issues, right? And, you know, well, what happens when you, um, you know, use opioids illicitly, right? So opioids can be used by crushing up the pills, injecting them, right, um, and abusing them, right? And so you can have um, infections in their blood, right? You could have your blood vessels collapse. You could have uh, hepatitis in your liver if you get certain viruses by exchanging needles, for example, right? Your digestive system can be affected by giving you um, constipation, right? Uh, and maybe even bowel obstructions over time, okay? Um, your immune system could be reduced. Certain types of blood cells can be downregulated, right? Your heart, your, your, um, your respiratory rate also re uh, gets depressed. Uh, and you have, um, it's um, uh, more shallow breathing, and that could be a problem, particularly if you take too much opioid, right? So, so we know that, you know that opioids, you know, are fraught with some issues, particularly, you know, over time, and when abused or, or used incorrectly, okay? Another thing you might, you might look at over here is the nervous system, right? So we have a system in our bodies, right, where we have our own endogenous, they're called endogenous opioids, right? endorphins, right? They're our own opioids in our body that, you know, they're released when we're jogging, for example. It's called the runner's high, right? Um, after you run, you feel really good because some of those endorphins were released, right? And so when we hijack the system by taking a whole lot of opioids, that has consequences, right? Uh, some of which we just spoke about, right? It turns out that we have receptors for opioids in our gut, and if we if we hijack the system, we get constipation. Right? Um, we have receptors, obviously, in our nerves. Okay? And when we hijack the system, when we stop taking the opioids, or when we get tolerant to them, we can get very sensitive because you were continuously used to having an external source of opioids. Now we're dependent on it. Now we need it to just have normal sensation. Without it, or without increasing the dose, you will have sensitivity. Okay, so how many, how many prescriptions do we give a year? This, this is a number from 2014, okay? 650,000, it's, it's about the same these days, okay? 650,000 prescription, not in, thousand prescriptions, not in a year, this is in a day, okay? Um, so um, that's, that's some pretty incredible math, right? About 600 people start heroin a day and lots more probably use um, synthetic opioids these days. And this number from 2014 is no longer 78. Do anybody know how many people die a year, a day, sorry, uh, these days uh, from opioid overdoses? It, it's over 100, it's like 120 or so a day. And a year, last year, about 60, 65,000 people died. And, you know, it's the highest, most common cause of death under the age of 50. That's a big problem. That's a big public health problem, right? So heart attacks, cancer, homicides, suicides, motor vehicle accidents, accidents, we've surpassed that. We've surpassed kidney disease as a cause of death under the age of 50, surpass heart attacks under the age of 50. So it's, it's significant. And so, um, you know, our president has called it a public health, you know, emergency, as far as I understand. Um, and now we're, we're, we're spending a whole lot of money on it, right? So um, some estimates say that, you know, it's cost us like $2 trillion thus far. Um, and it's gonna cost us about $500 billion every each year going forward for the next several years. So, you know, what's, what's, a, what's the next epidemic that's coming right now? 
is, you know, who knows, maybe it's the, the marijuana epidemic. I mean, kind of like the, the horse is out of the barn already, right? I mean, we, we were building dispensaries and, you know, all around. And we, we don't necessarily know, you know, how effective these medications are or substances. Kind of like the same, same kind of process that occurred with opioid 20 years ago. We weren't really sure how good they are long term, whether they're that effective, what the side effects are. But we kind of think it's, a, you know, some people like them. And, you know, um, maybe we should just kind of be proactive. You know, we want to make sure we control people's pain. And that's led to a big problem. And people are saying, oh, well, you know, taxes. You know, we could, we could collect taxes and collect a few million dollars here from, you know, dispensaries. They'll, they'll, pay, they'll pay some taxes. And, you know, you're not thinking about, well, how much are we going to pay down the line to control, like, this, this new problem that we're creating, right? Um, and already... In, 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 Cal in Colorado, where this is a recreational mo uh, product, um, you know, we're seeing a lot more accidents, um, thousands of motor vehicle accidents added, and also a lot of abdominal pain, stomach pains in youngsters that um, are, are using this very often. So, you know, it may be okay to, to smoke marijuana f for medical reasons or here and there, but if you smoke it every day, um, several times a day, that might create a problem. You know, uh, it might create uh, dependency. It might create some other physiological processes that we're not don't understand yet because it hasn't really been a bit wide, widely available, and not at, at the high quality that it's being produced in when it's you know legalized like it is now. So um, we're we're learning a lot about that now in states where you know voters have, have voted to make this like legal, totally legal. You know. Um, but when it comes to medical marijuana, I think that's always a question um, of, you know, of audiences that I talk to, and I'll be happy to answer more questions down the line. And I prescribe uh, marijuana for, for cancer patients and patients with certain really terrible conditions, some of which there's some good data on. But, um, but you know, we're, we're certainly seeing some, some issues now uh, associated with medical marijuana, um, and, uh, and that's... Medical marijuana is a recommendation of a physician. That's not voters deciding to allow something, um, a drug or not. There's two different things here. So when, we're, when as physicians, when we're recommending a molecule, um, just like the FDA does, we, we do testing and, and, and we have to say, well, do we think this is safe? Um, and I'm not sure um, you know, we're there yet on, on all the indications that even in this state, um, you know, we're allowing you know, marijuana for. There is some data on marijuana for, for Parkinson's, for example, or MS, and you know, spasticity associated with those conditions. Um, and those are recognized by those um, societies of like neurology, for example, and pain management. Um, but you know, more widely, there's a lot of questions. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. I was just going to ask, uh, you know, from a genetic perspective, uh, how would you study marijuana for some individuals who are at higher genetic risk Hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly marijuana um, can be um, problematic in certain certain people uh, that have some underlying psychiatric disease. Um, when you offer marijuana as a recreational drug, there's no screening process. So just anybody can go get it. Um, and then also a lot of the physicians that are, have sort of taken part in prescribing marijuana, um, they do so in a very... Um, almost like the pill mills of like the last decade uh, with opioids, they do so you know, with very little regulation, they charge cash, and um, they pretty much give everybody that walks through the door marijuana. Um, and so th that process doesn't actually happen. And uh, oftentimes they, you know, um, they treat like anxiety and depression with marijuana that might be very effective actually for them early on, but then down the line, it's actually, it actually causes very difficult rebound anxiety and depression. And, um, you know, that's, that's the truth there. So um, in terms of opioids, let's go back to opioids, kind of went on a long tangent there. Um, the, red, the red parts are where you have the most opioid overdose deaths. And as you can see, as you move in time, um, it, the map is getting redder and redder and redder, and we haven't gotten to the point where it's actually reached the peak yet. So we're doing a lot of things to curtail this, but we haven't necessarily reached the peak. 
So um, what's killing everybody here, uh, these people? Who's ki what's killing them? Uh, is, it, is it prescription opioids or is it heroin or fentanyl, right? We know now it's, it's more fentanyl in synthetic molecules. Um, you know, in the, in the early 2000s, it was more pills, okay? And then around 2011, you know, heroin became um, the, you know, much, a much faster rising cause of, of the overdose deaths. And anybody know why that is? Cheaper. It's cheaper, um, but what, what kind of came together as a perfect storm is that um, you were able to get it for pretty much for free, uh, the pills, early on, because they were just getting prescribed. And then we realized that maybe around, around that time that you know, we shouldn't prescribe that much, and so doctors started cutting back. Um, and the needs of the patients kept rising. And, um, and at that point, some of the pharmaceutical companies started making products that were called abuse deterrent products, where they couldn't abuse the products as much. So you couldn't crush them, you couldn't s s snort them or insufflate them is a technical term. Um, you couldn't crush them and inject them because they gelled up. And so, and they did that actually without telling the public. They did it as an epidemiologic study, okay? And they, they just changed the formulation for, to the, for the biggest drugs. Um, and they wanted to see what would happen. And the drug abusers didn't like that. And so they went to heroin, naturally, and they started abusing that more. And that was l less regulated and you know, at least they weren't using the drugs that we were prescribing, but um, they were using more illicit drugs. And that, that's where that movement went, and it's continuing, because now we're, we're curbing the, the, you know, the, the, prescri the, prescri the prescriptions. Um, the CDC has made guidelines for physicians, you may have heard about, um, that you know, we shouldn't prescribe more than a certain amount of milligrams a day for patients, and over a certain amount is really just not a good idea. And it's a guideline, but it's almost a law, okay? It's being treated by the regulatory bodies almost as a very strong recommendation, borderline law. And, you know, doctors who don't abide by that are, are um, you know, getting, um, you know, uh, educated on it and maybe, maybe um, out of business. And, um, and the reality is that there's a lot of different ways to control people's pain without, you know, irresponsibly prescribing opioids, all right? Um, and so here, this has also um, recently uh, been, been released by the National Academies of Science this past year. And they said, well, you know, we saw that rise in heroin, right? And well, are people dying because, they, you know, because of heroin because they started using heroin um, and, they, and they liked it? Or were they using the, the pills and then uh, for some reason they went on to heroin? Either they didn't have the pills anymore or uh, their requirements were too, were too high and they couldn't afford the pills. And so here in black um, are the people that, um, minority, that always use heroin from the beginning. They were junkies from the beginning, okay? And then here are different varieties of patients, whether they used heroin or oxycodone from the beginning, or with the blue, they used pills from the beginning. The majority of people started with pills. Uh, and then they went on to heroin. And so this is sort of a campaign for op safe opioid prescribing, okay? Um, you see Times Square and, you know, would you give your child heroin for a sports injury? Would you give heroin for dental procedure, right? And that's what we're doing, right? We're giving someone pharmaceutical grade heroin and morphine or oxycodone for something that, you know, we could probably treat without these medications. And, and you know, I'll tell you, for example, with dental procedures, if you give someone ibuprofen before the dental procedure, they have less pain than if you give them oxycodone after the procedure. That's been shown, okay? Um, by the way, you know, there's never been any data to support using opioids more than 16 weeks. It's a billion dollar industry, okay? But yet we don't have any data, no scientific data, that looks at opioids for longer than several months. And if there was that data, then it would probably be out there. But we don't have it, okay? Because you get tolerant to the medication and it stops working that well, okay? Some patients, you spoke about genetics, can, can do fine. I mean, they could, they could take the pills, stop them, 
and then start them again if they need to. Um, you know, I have patients like that, you know. Uh, take a few pills here and there, stop, or they continue. They don't ever have go up on their dose. Um, they're not genetically predisposed for dependency. Their, um, their family, there's no history of, of addiction or dependence or, 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 or psychiatric disease and such of things. And, <clears throat> you know, in, in my clinic, we follow guidelines to um, do several things when we prescribe opioids. So sometimes patients get Tylenol and, and Motrin and the nerve block and it's just not enough, okay? And they call you and they say, we want something stronger. Um, you know, I went to the ER and, you know, it's just, you know, I have a lot of pain. You know, the surgery gone wrong, you know, like a root canal got wrong. We've, we may have all been there, right? And, 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 you know, well, maybe we can give them a few pills, right? And so who is someone we want to give pills to versus who we don't want to give any pills to, okay? So some of those risk factors we just spoke about, right? So well, how do we systematically control for that, right? So in our clinic, everybody does a urine test when they come in. We test to see if there's anything on their urine that we might want to know about, like cocaine or something like that. That would be a good indicator that this is not a good person to put on something that you can get dependent on, right? Um, we also do what's called the opioid risk tool, okay? It's a test where we ask them several questions, like if they've had family history of substance abuse, personal history of substance abuse, psychiatric history, um, abuse, um, sexual abuse uh, as a child, um, certain age demographics, those sorts of things. And, um, and, and those have shown to be predictive of having problems, okay? And so if someone like, has like a bunch of hits on a bunch of the, the different points, then they may be a bad person to put on opioids. And so, and sometimes we have to, right? But then we do everything we can to make sure that, you know, we, we monitor this, this process, right? Um, and then we may want to do urine toxins ongoing and those sorts of things. Um, and we also check to see how useful these medications are, right? We follow how functional they are over time. We don't just ask them, well, how, how's your pain right now? Is it a five or is it a 10, right? Um, one person's 10 is another person's five, right? So we ask them, well, could you do your errands today? You know, could you walk your dog? And then maybe they said no. Maybe next time when we do an injection or we give them certain medication, opioid or non-opioid, we then check back in and we see how well they're doing. And we have some tests now, some tools, some of which I've worked on myself. Um, one is a pocket tool where it's an app where it's patient facing, you interact with it, interact with other people with pain, and you talk about what things work, what things don't work, and then it asks, these question, it asks you questions that are not so, so direct, but then eventually they come up with a very good idea of how well you're doing. Uh, and then we have cert certain things in the clinic where we do the same thing. And so some patients will tell you, doc, you know, you're doing all this, um, all these procedures or, or medications or physical therapy or acupuncture, whatever it is. But, you know, my pain's still a 10, you know? But then when we look at, at this data, which is very robust, we can see that their sleep's gotten better and that they, their pain hasn't interfered as much in their pain, in their life. All kinds of, 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 these, of these graphs over time that we can then show the patient and say, hey, look, you're actually doing really well. All that work you put in, it's actually been, you know, pr productive, right? And so, like I said before, I alluded to this, there's about a third of our country that's dealing with chronic pain. You may have someone in your family that has headaches. Someone might have hip pain, right? Someone might have back pain. About a third of us do. We all end up having some level of pain in our lives and it may or may not become chronic, right? So it costs us about half a trillion dollars a year. And um, that's in just, like, you know, um, societal costs. And then like direct costs are around $100 billion. And those are, you know, procedures and surgeries and medications. And, and it reduces their quality of life. So there's been a Nobel Prize laureate economist that's written on this. It was picked up by Goldman Sachs uh, recently. Um, and you know, he's shared w with us just how much impact this, is, this has had on our, on our society in terms of 
lost wages and the amount of people in a, of a certain age group that you know maybe should be working but are not. In our, in our history, we're at a point where the biggest proportion of that age group and people that are willing, uh, willing and able to work are not. And it's probably related to a lot of chronic pain in our society for whatever reason. You know, why do we have so many allergies in our societies? I don't know. Why do we have so much chronic pain in our society these days? I don't know. Um, but we do, and then we also have a dependency issue now on opioids, and that's keeping people from doing work. And it's costing us, okay? Um, and so, you know, what's the pain continuum, right? Someone has their hand up, by the way? No? Okay, well, we'll take, what's that? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll take questions at the end, okay? Um, so the pain continuum, right? So, you know, patients might have some injuries, right? A carpal tunnel, maybe you type too much, right? Um, and then you might have surgery or have rehab or, you know, PT, right? And then at some point you get better, right? But then other times, you know, patients may not get better, right? And they may have pain for quite some time. And so, well, what, what's the definition of chronic pain? Chronic pain is defined as pain that does not get better within three months, but continues longer than three months. That's by definition chronic pain. And it's not, it's just, it's not just a number or a definition. It's actually, there's a reason why that's called chronic pain. Chronic pain develops <coughs> by a process of our, our system becoming more sensitive. And there's a lot of genetics that occur so genes in our body that get expressed that cause us to have more sensitivity to the same stimulus as we did before. And then we get like this. After a while, we get very sad. <coughs> and um, can, I use, can I drink this, by the way? It's closed. Um, we can get very sad, right? And um, you know, why do people get sad when they have chronic pain? It's because they can't do what they normally do, right? They can't, um, they have bad back, now they can't go to work, they can't do yard work, right? They really love to do that stuff, right? They get rewarded for doing that. They get rewarded for playing basketball with their kids, right? Now they can't do that anymore, so now they're unhappy. You know, their mood changes, they get anxious. <clears throat> they may not be able to go to work, um, bring home a salary, that kind of stuff. And so it has wide implications, right? Um, and we spoke a little bit about sensitivity, right? So I liken chronic pain to an electric guitar, okay? So electric guitar, the guitar itself is like the strings, right? It's like the nerve endings, right? And you could play and you hear nice music, but then when you connect the cord, the spinal cord to the brain, which is the amplifier, that can really reverberate and cause you to have very uncomfortable noise, right? So the music might turn to noise depending on the amplifier. So if your amplifier, your brain is very anxious and you know, the mood is, is very depressed, well then the amplifier is on reverberate and the music will turn to noise and it's gonna be very uncomfortable. So that's what happens to people, people that have fibromyalgia or um, they have back pain and it's been ongoing for so many years that they're amplified. Um, and it's like a snowball effect. Their brain becomes more and more sensitized. Um, and when we take animals and we injure animals in experiments, we could see over time, within hours after the inflammation or injury, their spinal cords and brains have an imprint where the pain is, and that is gonna heighten the response to even light touch. So for example, let's say um, in the old days when we were cave people, right? cavemen and women, right? So we would stub our toe on a rock and then we would be very sensitive. We would have like a red toe, right? And it would be very sensitive to the touch and we felt like we should go back to the cave because if we weren't back in the cave, we couldn't run very fast and then the tiger would catch us, right? And we would die, right? And so we, we developed uh, an evolutionary sort of process where we're gonna rest and get better until our pain has subsided um, and then we would return and hunt again, okay? So that's acute pain, but then chronic pain is what happened, and then one caveman, you know, didn't get better, and then their toe became red and painful for a long time, 
and became chronic. It never got better. He stayed in the cave, became very sedentary, and um, never got better. They didn't have PT back then, okay? Or opioids. Um, so um, that, that's chronic pain, okay? So it's an evolutionary, an evolution, evolutionary adaptation that maybe has gone haywire, okay? So, you know, when, when you talk about this hypersensitivity state that we have with acute pain that's turned chronic, right? Well, can we, can we really believe that, um, you know, a pill is going to make that better, right? It's, it's probably going to be either a very specialized pill. Uh, it may be, um, you know, a series of medications. Um, or it may be a series of different interventions. It might be physical therapy. It might be nutrition. It might be different medications, injections, biofeedback, psychology. <coughs> all these people, all these providers are going to work with you to reverse this process, okay, on various different levels in your body, okay? And even medication-wise, pharmacologically, we have medications that will help you on multiple different levels in your nervous system, okay? So you may have heard about, you know, lidocaine or numbing medications. So when you go to the dentist, they numb it up. Right? They numb it up, you don't feel the pain. Right? And then they could use um, these medications, these numbing medications, long term. They could use nerve blocks for surgery, or they can leave a catheter in where it's going to infuse over time, and you're not going to have pain for days. Right? Lyrica, gabapentin, we use those for neuropathy. Right? Lyrica is, is FDA approved for diabetic neuropathy. Why? Because it's shown to be effective. We actually did the studies, and it's reduced pain about 30-40%. Um, so Balta, I'll show you the data in a little bit, you know, how it's helped patients with fibromyalgia or neuropathy. It actually reduces the numbness and tingling. It reduces the burning, right? And these are effective long-term, right? And they improve function. They don't reduce function. Um, ketamine, you know, is a medication that has come back, so to speak, and, and is in a renaissance where, you know, we're, we're now in clinical trials for depression and suicidality where a single shot of ketamine might really help people that have depression, for example. Um, Tylenol, Celebrox, anti-inflammatories, right? These are all medications that are going to help you on a, on, a, on a certain level. So, you know, the numbing medication works on the strings, right, and the nerve endings. They also work on the spinal cord and, 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 and nerves and nerve blocks and epidurals. Um, we use the ketamine and the spinal cord in the brain. We use Cymbalta and Lyrica on the brain and the spinal cord. And so we use medications on the guitar, we use it on the strings, the cable, and we use it on the amplifier, right? And if we do a good job of, of kind of using, a, using a sort of a cornucopia of different medications, we get a better effect than just maximizing one medication, okay? And, um, and, and you'll see how we, we utilize that in, uh, you know, like in a surgical setting too, okay? to get you out of the hospital quicker with less side effects and so forth, okay? And so this right here is you know, a lot of data and you know, it might not mean much to you, but um, <clears throat> these are people that have pain and, and because of diabetes in their, in their feet, right? They have burning feet. You guys know people that have burning feet because of diabetes? Neuropathy it's called? You guys know, anybody know anybody that, with neuropathy? Yeah, so um, you know, you, you could, I've, I've, I've seen patients that, um, that, that have, have, have taken opioids for neuropathy. You know, is, is, are the opioids FDA approved for neuropathy? What do you think? They're not, but yet they're given all the time. Are opioids FDA approved for dentist, dental work? Okay, are they approved for chronic pain due to back pain? What do you think? Why do you think it's, why do you think maybe because everyone's using it for back pain? Uh, but it's, it's not, it's not approved. For, so it's actually approved for acute pain. So it might be after dental procedure, it might be after surgery. Um, but it's, it's, they're, they're approved for, for acute pain, severe acute pain that you can't treat with anything else. And they're, and they're also approved for like cancer pain and like those sorts of things. So, so um, intractable pain conditions. And so this is a medication like called Cymbalta, duloxetine, um, for neuropathy, and you can see people here that took the medication had less pain than patients that did not take the medication. Um, about 30% less pain. So if they said their pain was a 10, now it's a seven, okay? 
Um, and this is the same thing, um, you know, same medication for fibromyalgia. So patients that have fibromyalgia are very sensitive. They're like, they're amplified, right? So uh, their joints hurt everywhere, okay? Um, kind of like a migraine where, you know, you have a bad headache, you can't see light, you gotta go to a darker room, everything just seems really loud, right? Um, same thing with fibromyalgia. It's, it's, it's a hypersensitivity state. And, and, and Cymbalta, duloxetine, randomized controlled trial, okay? Everything's blinded, no one knows what we're taking, and so the data's really good, okay? Um, high quality, and you could see that patients that took the medication, regardless of the dose, did better than patients that did not do the medication, okay? And they did better by about 30% again, which is what the FDA requires for saying it's a good medication. So it's approved, okay? It's available uh, for use with people with fibromyalgia. How many people have I seen in the last year that are taking opioids for fibromyalgia? A lot, okay? Are they still having the pain? Yeah, um, you know, and that's unfortunate, okay? So, I mean, we were misinformed, I would say, um, as, as, as a society and, um, and as uh, a profession, okay? Um, we were sold a bag of goods, that these are really, really good for a lot of different things, and if you keep going up on the dose, it's okay. By the industry. Pharmaceutical industry. So very similar to, uh, very similar to tobacco, okay? So, and um, I, I'm not sure if you, if, if, if you know this, but um, for example, like Purdue, which is, you know, uh, you know very close to here, uh, the headquartered close to here, that they paid out about $600 million, I think in 2012, for settling a criminal lawsuit about improper marketing of OxyContin. And um, they, they at some point said that um, only about 1% of patients taking OxyContin would develop dependency or addiction, which was totally incorrect. It's actually much higher than that. And, um, you know, uh, there's a good book out there called um, Dreamland, um, and it's about just like the process of, you know, pain in this country. It's a New York, New York Times bestseller, Dreamland. Uh, do a really good job, they do a really good job of just narrating the whole process of, you know, pain in this country and, you know, opioids is like the next best thing. And then um, how we went up and up on the dose and then we gave pa patients the medications such as oxycodone where they can abuse it very easily. And they did and then they moved to heroin and then fentanyl and now we're at where we're at. And, um, and uh, so um, it's a good question. So I mean, morphine—it's—it's it, it, you know coming from the research side um, of things. We always used to joke how morphine ever got FDA approval, right? It's a medication that um, you know has a lot of side effects, you know, but it, it never really had to get approved. It was just around, you know. It was one of the drugs that just got grandfathered in when they created the FDA. So. Opioids were just around, and they just have, like, um, you know, an insert that says, you know, you got to be really careful. But in the 1990s and late 80s, we were, we changed our mindset, our perspective on opioids. In the 80s, the early 80s, we were very careful with opioids, as we've always been. Okay. Um, and then in the, in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, um, through a lot of marketing and lobby we became much more liberal with opioids. We came up with an idea that we need to take care of patient's pain. We must. And physicians got in a lot of trouble if they didn't take care of their pain, a patient's pain. And the Joint Commission, which is the commission that makes sure there's quality in medicine, they created a law, basically what's called the fifth vital sign. They said you gotta do vital signs on patients, right, blood pressure, pulse, and so forth. The fifth vital sign, the new one in the 90s, was the pain, was pain. And that was pushed through, and then if you didn't control their pain, the hospital would get docked, okay? Up until very recently, two years ago, if you didn't take care of a patient's pain, you would get less reimbursement from Medicare. So we're a country where we, we like to incentivize people. How do you think that incentivized physicians? 
you think that would give him cause him to prescribe more or less? Right. So patients have a lot of pain. We want to get their pain scores down so we get you know four percent versus two percent back from Medicare this year. Okay, it's just the way it is. About a year and a half ago, they took that out of the equation. Okay, um, some really smart people kind of kind of went in there and lobbied for that. Okay, um, but but that that's what's happened um, and. Which is why I'm very fearful with like the whole mom, you know, the medical marijuana thing. And not that I'm anti-marijuana or really anti-opioids even. You know, I think that they, they serve a role. But, um, but we have to make sure that we're doing this responsibly um, rather than, than, than just jump to, uh, to different processes. So, so, and over here, for example, this is a, this is a paper out of um, the 1950 or 64, I believe, right? In the England Journal of Medicine. And, and you know what they did here? They just talked to patients. They said, well, what if we take a bunch of patients that just had surgery and we coach them, right? We just say, hey, look, you know, we're going to have a meeting before surgery. We're going to tell you about what's going to happen. We're going to prepare you. You're going to have some pain. This pain is going to be manageable. We're going to take deep breaths. We're going to teach you some exercises, kind of like Lamaze, you know? Lamaze helps patients, right, that, that are undergoing labor. It's just breathing, right? We all know about it, right? And it's pretty, pretty helpful, right? Yeah. People buy into it, right? And so they've shown that pretty good data that, you know, by coaching patients, you know, patients that were in this treatment group did better than the patients in the control group where they just got meds. No one, no one talked to them. They're anxious. They didn't know what to expect. And so building a rapport with patients is important. And we kind of know that, right? It's kind of like being a good doctor. But we don't always do that because, again, in this country, we're incentivized to kind of just churn it out, right? And you know, that's changing because... Really smart people in this country have tried to incentivize this differently over the last several years. Okay, and we're now incentivized for quality, okay, not volume. Okay, and um, great organizations now are working in that direction to provide better quality and reimbursement schemes now through Medicare, and, and some of the payers are following this. They're paying for better quality care. Okay. Um, and at Stanford right now, we're creating a pain center that, that you know, is, is driven you know, for quality, okay? And, you know, we have a robust um, physical therapy offering, for example. We have one here at the YMCA right down the street, okay? Um, patients finish that. They graduate the physical therapy. They go to the pool, right? Uh, we have a Chelsea Piers, which is a wonderful facility where we have the HSS, Stanford Health Collaborative Physical Therapy uh, facility that's very sporty for the sports injuries and so forth is very good. Um, we have the Tully Center, um, we have Greenwich. You know, there's, there's various different centers, and they're all really, really great. Um, and we communicate with those providers, so we don't just like send them off to some rehab place. And there's going to be like one to five ratio, which occurs all the time. Okay, but we have pretty much a one to one ratio, sometimes one to two, but it's very personal, and you know, I, I get an email from them saying, well, how's this patient doing, okay? And I kind of follow up on it, and that's important because that's, again, a measure of how, patient, how a patient's doing versus just, you know, getting a pain score or having them tell you in the office how they're doing. We get a sense from function how they're doing, okay? And then we do, like, some procedures. There's nerve blocks, epidurals, those sorts of things that have been shown to be effective, and we do all that. We do everything from, you know, joint injections to you know, some, some epidural type, type processes that we use for cancer pain. There's all kinds of like in, uh, pumps that we can put in, like ports, where medication goes into the spinal column, giving patients comfort without causing them some sedation. So we have all kinds of approaches that we use um, that are advanced, um, that are offered, um, you know, in, in, our, in our center, okay? Uh, we also have integrative medicine, acupuncture, nutrition, pain psychology, all kinds of things to help you get here, all right? Um, become well, not necessarily um, just for the sake of doing something, okay? And, 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 and in the hospital, when let's say you come in for a total knee replacement, we have a whole team that's gonna take care of you, right? The surgeons, the anesthesiologists, the pain service comes around every day, builds that rapport. We might have an, even see you before. If, if you come into the clinic, the surgical clinic, and you kind of check off all the boxes for, 
you know, psychiatric issues, um, you know, you had difficulty coping with certain things, um, you may have had <clears throat> some challenges getting off opioids the last time around, um, those sorts of things, or a really difficult surgery, we'll have you come in early ahead of time and we kind of figure out a plan that you're comfortable with, that you're on board with, and hopefully we can make the stay more comfortable for you, reduce some of the anxiety, and hopefully then, you know, there's less pain and discomfort around the time of surgery. And so now we have what's called the perioperative optimization clinic at Stanford, where I have a checklist and they have it. And if you check off enough boxes, you get a free trip to the pain clinic. And, um, and then patients love it because you know what? It's for, it's for their own good. They realize that. And so patients don't have a problem with getting optimized. That's what we have found. And that's great, because everyone's invested in their own health, right? And so nursing, pharmacy, you know, things like, you know, you gotta have medications on the floor. You got all kinds of, you can't just have opioids, right? Now you gotta get Celebrex and Lyrica, and so it's been a process, right? And we have all that stuff now. Uh, physical therapy on the floor and, and, and rehab, and we have what's called even a recreational therapist. We have a young lady that comes to the floor and, you know, she does, plays games with certain patients that have chronic pain or she has mindfulness-based stress reduction, all kinds of stuff that's non-pharmacologic that we're doing that's gonna help patients, right? And so this, for example, is something that we do for joint procedures, right? So you see, we give patients something right before they go into the, right before they go into the room, okay? If you come to my clinic for that pre-op visit, I might give you like one pill of each, and I might give you that to take right before you come into the hospital. When you wake up from surgery, you're not gonna be in a lot of pain, you know? And then we're gonna give you a nerve block and we're gonna leave it in for a few days, for example. So we get the knee numb, right? Or the shoulder numb, so you don't need medications, right? I'm gonna give you anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, like the, the Lyricas and the Gabapentins, just to reduce the need for opioids. And what's, that's gonna, what's, what's that gonna do? It's gonna reduce the nausea and vomiting. It's gonna reduce the constipation. All those kinds of things that make your stay kind of really not, not fun, right? That's the kind of stuff you remember that you don't really enjoy around the time of surgery, right? Um, and so that's all getting at the quality of, um, of medicine, right? And as we improve the quality, we hopefully also improve the patient experience, right? And the satisfaction that you get going through the process, right? And like I said, now, the way it's been structured, we actually get reimbursed um, an enhanced reimbursement for that, right? And so it's really interesting, and we could have a whole conversation about like medical economics, right? But we're doing a really good job now of, um, you know, uh, aligning interests of patients, physicians, um, and hospitals. Whereas very recently, we were basically just paying for volume, okay? The more procedures people do, get done, the more we get paid. Okay, um, and that created mills, you know, doctor's offices where people just came in and out. 10 minutes, five minutes visits, right? Um, they didn't get paid on quality. They didn't get docked if they had bad outcomes, okay? Now, if we have a readmission after surgery or patients that have an infection, we don't get paid for that, for that visit. So, you know, doctors that may not be just doing it for the, for the, the better of the patient, they may just make sure, extra sure, that everything gets done right. And so that's just an important, I think, piece of, I think, medicine of the future. And um, that's what's gonna really reduce costs for our society and also make you healthier, right? So we're all in it together, okay? And um, this means that, you know, for your pain, you know, we're all in the same boat. And what's that? You come out of the hospital looking like that. Exactly, <laughs> um, exactly. So, um, you know, and, um, you know, that's after we, you know, we, we heal you, right? So um, that's, that's all I got for you today, um, sort of the formal uh, presentation, and I'm um, willing to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Yes, that. And my question is, as 
chorus of Ibsen or the tendency. This one is uh, from what? The Oscars? The Oscars. Hmm. This is the slide you, you meant? Or? Okay. I'm about to write them down. So. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Um, so, that's an interesting question. I don't know that there's a good answer to that. Um, you know, people get addicted to heroin, right? That's an opio opiate, right? And people get addicted to fentanyl. So, um, I would say people get addicted to either one of those molecules. Um, obviously, the more potent ones, you know, are more problematic, you know? But, um, you know, it's, it's a problem either way. And, you know. It's an opioid or an OBA? It's an opioid. Oxycontin is, is, is extended release oxycodone. Okay? It's basically, um, and, and that really was one of the drugs that really drove the opioid epidemic. Okay? Um, interesting thing happened was that um, the, the oxycodones, like in Percocet, you guys heard of Percocet? Uh, Percocet is a combination of, of oxycodone and Tylenol, pretty much, acetaminophen. And when you combine those drugs, patients can't abuse it too much of it because we all know that you can't take, take too much, you can't take too much Tylenol. You get, your, your liver is gonna die, right? So abusers had to like somehow remove the Tylenol and all kinds of chemical you know, processes. Um, and so they can't, you couldn't use more than about 10 tablets a day, okay, of this, of this Percocet. And so they were limited in their ability to abuse those drugs. Um, and then what happened was they created OxyContin, which was a pill that had not just 10, but 20, but maybe 40, 80, and even at some point, 160 milligrams in one pill. So now, and doctors were gonna give it. Doctors were given it because Again, there was a fifth vital sign. Um, patients were getting 1,000 milligrams of morphine a day, okay? They were, until recently, 1,000, 2,000. We were giving people one person more than some countries gave their entire country in a year, okay? That's the truth, okay? So, and it was in fentanyl products, morphine, and so OxyContin was the first one that allowed, before they reformulated, all that drug to be abused without having fear of the acetaminophen. And that really caused a big, big peak in the <laughs> abuse of opioids in this country. So yeah. kind of interesting history didn't, there. Didn't they, also, didn't they also say that it would uh, last for eight hours and the oxycontin didn't, so people were then up in the doses they were taking with yeah. the doctors helping them? Yeah. So, um, they had a problem with that too, you know, um, that they said it was going to be a 12 hour drug and it's really, well, it really was an eight. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the truth there. Is this a U.S. problem or is it a worldwide problem? More U.S. problem. Mm -hmm. More U.S. problem. Um, other countries um, have been very fearful of making that switch from being, you know, less liberal to more liberal. Um, and, um, you know, a lot, a lot of these synthetic opioids that are now being brought into this country are, um, are actually coming from China and, um, and Mexico, where there's a little less, less regulation, um, and they're being brought on to here, which is, you know, the, the, the fentanyl-type products that you're hearing about causing a lot of opio um, opioid overdoses. So, you know, those molecules aren't necessarily being used other places. Um, they're being abused here. And I don't know if it's because it's just like a, a first world type of a problem. Um, you know, you know, the, the cocaine was, you know, came from, you know, South America, let's say, and then it was abused in North America, right? I mean, um, because of certain reasons, socioeconomic reasons, who knows. But, um, but the use, like 90 something percent of all the opioids are used in this country right now. Um, yeah. We're not, we're, they're not paying for it. Those other countries aren't paying for it. The, you know, the insurances don't believe in it. And it's just good medicine, really. It's just like they, there's no data on it.
Yeah, it's a great question. So um, I touched on some of those. Um, so in terms of pharmacology, we spoke about different medications, number one, right? Different medications that are non-opioids, nerve pain type pills. There's all kinds, okay? And, and they're much, much better than they've ever, than ever been. And you have to, again, you have to use pharmacology, you know, interventions, um, uh, psychology, rehab, if these really kind of one of each, right? I call them pillars, right? Uh, four or five pillars, right, of pain management. So in terms of like physical therapy or rehab, and we have, for example, for people that have um, phantom limb pain where they lost a limb and now they have pain as if they had a, f a foot there and now they're having very severe pain in where was the foot, but not no longer, right? It could be a very difficult um, type of condition. And, um, you know, we have like virtual reality, for example, okay? Um, they're, they're using that to uh, simulate like a leg and that tends to help patients, for example, right? Um, the, the application I was telling you about where you can interact with other people that have had your condition and what, what's worked for them, that engagement process can be very therapeutic, right? Pain psychologists, they're people that have, professionals that have a degree, psych D, psych doctor, or um, they might have uh, a PhD, either one of those are clinical psychologists, and then they do an extra year of pain management psychology, and they do all kinds of, they teach you Jedi mind tricks, if you will, right? Um, ways to reduce your pain by thought and certain uh, biofeedback techniques we're, we're learning a lot about that. And we're learning a lot about, you know, what people, what types of people have problems with certain medications and what don't, uh, whether it's genetics or history taken with their psychology or the behaviors. Um, so we're tailoring our care. Um, we're doing genetics, pharmacogenetic genetics. We're learning about which patients would respond better to different medications. Okay, why are you taking this medication at a dose that's very low, but then like a friend of yours is taking 10 times that dose. There are certain medications that you're, you metabolize differently. And so now we can do a blood test and figure out where you are, right? And certain medications are the same for everybody. Others are metabolized very differently. So we're doing some of those testings, right? Um, we're doing different procedures. There are different types of stimulators these days. For example, um, spinal cord stimulators. They came out with a new product now where, you know, if you have phantom limb pain, let's say, um, or pain down the leg after surgery where it didn't go away, we could, we could thread up an epidural, um, if you will, and then you know, th that epidural then stimulates the spinal cord and um, makes you feel really nice sensations down your legs versus the painful ones, and that could be very effective. Um, those types of things, there's a lot we can do. Um, it entails having a very thorough evaluation and then also using a team. So it's hard to provide a lot of these types of things to patients, you know, in, in a remote office. But what we're trying to build with the resources that we have now, and one of the reasons why I came here is because I felt that we can, we can accomplish something special here and we have the resources to bring on board. Like I said, the, the rehab, you know, in all these different locations um, where let's say you put in a device like that that we spoke about, they can then go to physical therapy and then work with them with that device to get better and rehab and then go back to work and so forth. So there's a lot we can do um, aside from medications. In fact, I hardly ever prescribe someone with back pain opioids on their first visit. Now, four years ago, probably everybody would get opioids on their first visit, right? So we're changing drastically. In fact, patients themselves will come to you and say, I don't want opioids, right? And that's very different than the message you got a year or two ago, where, you know, give me opioids, control my pain, you know, it, it's fine, you know. And, and, and sometimes we find ourselves saying, you just had surgery, it's okay. We're doing a lot of different things to reduce the amount of opioids you're using. You can use them for, if, you, if you need, we'll help you, if necessary, come off this, if this becomes an issue, you know, in the days to come. And so we offer that continuity of care um, before surgery, during the time of hospital stay, and then we can catch you afterwards to provide the continuity of care. Same physician is gonna be, one of ours is gonna be 
you know, in any of those settings, pre, peri, or post-operative. And so that's important these days to, to maintain the quality, right? Not just to get you through, through the door. We wanna make sure that you get the whole, you know, go through the process and, and, and you do so well. Um, okay, um, I had knee surgery four years ago and experienced what you just talked about as far as um, opioids being given for the pain. And I was not able to, to take them well because I call what I had was the demons and so it messed with my brain. Mm. But in, and I was in the hospital when this happened. And in spite of that, <coughs> when I left the hospital and had this little packet of things that you take with you, in there was 90 oxycodones for me to take while I was home, 90. So what, I, what I'm suggesting is they didn't listen. There was no team at that hospital. It was not here in this city. So there's no reflection here. And having a team and having people diagram you and, no, and then know that there's going to be follow-up, I think is so important to this <coughs> process if it's going to work at all. Because I don't understand where the responsibility of doctors often was or lies with them determining actually the need for someone who comes in with pain. Having been married to an endodontist, you talked about dentistry, Early on in his career, he, he began to have to decipher those that were actually in pain and those that were calling just for the pill. And that's something all doctors are confronted with. And so that it was interesting that it had yeah. run awry so terribly. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm really pleased to see that there's really some wonderful progress in this area, so thank you. Mm. I appreciate your comments. Um, yeah. It was, it was fairly recently where you can prescribe a lot of pills, like you said, uh, for just routine post-op management. Now, you're not, you're not supposed to. Um, there's guidelines. Uh, they just changed the guidelines, by the way. Mm -hmm. I was reading this on, uh, in the parking lot, actually. They just today released, uh, they, they downgraded even less the amount of pills you can prescribe to someone like yourself. So the first prescription. It's, it's gone from five days or seven days to three. And then what happens after three days? You need to then go see the doctor again. Mm -hmm. So doctors don't like the fact that they have to, they have to see the patient like uh, three days afterwards. You know, they, they prefer to just give you the pills and see you later. They don't want to see you have a, you don't want to have a phone call on, on a Sunday night. Three days just ran out, right? So again, that requires like a system where, you know, someone's going to evaluate you and, you have to know exactly when that's going to be discharged on Friday. It's going to be enough pills for Monday. And it's, we, we, we look at that stuff. You know, that's the kind of stuff that we've had to face, you know, in this new environment where, you know, we want to make sure that everything's done right. You know, like the, we make sure you have a ride. You know, we make sure that um, you understand, like, what pills you could take. You know, that you, like, wash a certain way before surgery so we reduce infections. And every little, we might give you, like, a scrub or something. Every little thing is thought through so we have the best outcomes. And again, it's been incentivized in a way where we got us all in the same room as physicians where you know, we weren't run like corporations. You know? Now we are because you know, we need to be. And that's beautiful that you know, we've become like a mature field where we're acting like, 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 a real, like a real organization should, where the goal is you, you know, getting better. And so we would never see 90 pills in the first, um, phys like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or someone, someone might have gone into your, your cabinet and taken it and abused it, you know, without you knowing. Um, and um, like I said, th there are guidelines now, um, you know, to prevent that from happening. And, you know, we're giving people like 20 pills, you know, um, you know, when they go home, just enough so we know that they're, they're comfortable. Uh, with instructions and so forth. Yeah. So it is 7.45. We have time for about one more question. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> I'm just wondering, do you see any, uh, you know, starting to um, go up on the opioid deaths? Yeah. Is so that increasing? Do you see? I don't. Uh, we haven't. It's not me. Um, but we haven't yet. And um, 
that's because we haven't done anything to prevent it. You know, we are putting all our money in areas that may not be as effective. So, for example, what's, what's been like the biggest initiative for the opioid crisis? Narcan. Narcan is a great tool to save someone that had just, you know, had a, had a, had a big overdose. The reality is that 30 to 40 percent of those those individuals will then have a second overdose and they're going to die within that first year after being saved. So we put like for example like you know our city has received hundreds of thousands of dollars and that's gone to instead of prevention treatment such as Narcan. So you know instead of paying you know helping me pay for a pain psychologist right or a social worker to help the patient when they come into the ER so they can get in touch with the next rehab center, right? Or to follow them over time, it's called a rehab coach. We have those, we have people like that. You know, we can't pay for them. That's where the money should go. You know, the money should be used more wisely. Right now we're using it, you know, um, in ways that are, are, are just not helping. You know, and um, you know, at Stanford, for example, we're working with the Department of Health um, to create a video you know, a series, actually two videos, one in English. Um, actually, so we're doing both these videos, two videos, both in English and Spanish, and we're doing them um, to educate patients about, about how to take care of their pain, kind of like what we did today, um, and how to use opioids safely. And we're doing the same thing for physicians. Because there's a bunch out there that don't understand this. And they are either gonna lose their license after they, they, not, they, they kill a few people, or um, they're gonna learn. How to how to adjust to you know you know what we're doing today to treat patients effectively and safely. So. Yeah. So I'm gonna have a little box over here. Everyone can can chip in and uh, no no no. But you know, the reality is that there's a yeah. I have a wish list and and you know yeah. Yeah, so, so there's, there's an issue of pain, med there's also um, like addiction medicine, right? There's addiction medicine, it's a whole other field. I happen to be boarded in addiction medicine also, um, but um, it's, you know, it's, these are system kind of, system approaches, um, and you know, you really have to have a system. So um, you can have a psychiatry unit, So, so, so yes. Yeah. So so we have spoken about, for example, having a rehab coach in our ER, mm -hmm. and we couldn't pay for it. Okay. okay. So um, you know that just got tabled. You know, and what that would do is they would talk to anybody that came in for an overdose, mm -hmm. and they would hook them up with either a Suboxone clinic down the street, or a methadone clinic down the street, and they would follow up with them. Mm -hmm. That's what's necessary. It's been shown to be effective. Okay. Um, we, you know, have a clinic where, you know, we're short-staffed, you know, like any other clinic. And, you know, we don't have the, the pain psychologist in our, in our office. Like I had at Stanford in California, where I came from in, in practice, we had four. Four pain psychologists. And, you know, they would tell us, hey, look, you know, I saw Mr. Jones. You remember that guy, you know, um, pain's worse. It's a really sad story. Um, you know, he's really depressed. Really negatively affecting his pain. You may want to, you know, adjust this medication or that. Um, or it might be a very positive message. But they're across the hallway, and so we could have an in, not just a multidisciplinary, but an interdisciplinary type of, of, of approach uh, in a setting. And that's, the right, that's what we need for patients. And then, like, once a week, like, you have lunch, and you talk about, you know, um, you have to provide lunch, otherwise no one else, no one comes. But, you know, we have, we have a, a conference multidisciplinary conference and we talk about a patient from different perspectives. Some, the, the pain psychologist, the rehab person, the PT, the doctor, you all talk about how we're doing and then you make adjustments. You see the patient in the afternoon and then you make adjustments. That's what's done. There's, there's really none of, there's, there's not one place in the New York metro area that has that. Okay? And, and, and I'll tell you, we want to build it. Okay? okay? That, that's what we're here for. And, um, 
That's what we had, you know, at Stanford. And that's what they, they have, um, you know, for example, um, in Wisconsin, okay, or at Mayo Clinic. There are some places that have that. So you have a model for each of these places. Yeah, and we're building it. it yes, and in, in one year we've come a long, long way. And I think we're right now we're at a place where we're above and beyond, you know, um, like the like the small clinic, you know, that, that you can find anywhere, you know, a pain clinic. We offer services, like I said, like obviously continuity of care, in-house, out, you know, cancer pain, joint pain, headaches, all kinds of things like that. We're working on a website to 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 actually demonstrate that. Right now, the website does not is totally inaccurate um, and doesn't talk about anything that we do um, that we discussed today. So we're working on that too. We're doing a lot of different things. Um, and um, I'm glad to be able to share it with you. Um, and, um, and perhaps at some point when we're ready, we can you know, reach out to philanthropy you know, and um, make this really, you know, like a really, really special place. So, yeah. So due to the time, that will be the end of our open questions. I'd like to thank you for attending and Dr. Wellish for his time this evening. Uh, perhaps while he wraps up, he can take some of your questions one-on-one -on -one, though. Thank you.